Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. Good to be with you. You're going to ask me uh, my favorite question, my, my great summer job growing up, right? Yeah, what was your favorite summer job growing up? And since you've already told us about your tennis refing career, you have to go somewhere else other than that. Oh, come on. <laughs> Actually, it was a combination of things. One summer, I uh, spent a good part of the summer digging out pools. It's pretty grueling work uh, when you're you know, going down beneath to try to get out all the roots. So mm-hmm. that was that was grueling. I did that the same summer that I was working at tennis courts, uh, and I was doing a little teaching of tennis and umpiring of tennis. So that was a great summer because I had a chance to travel, uh, but the pool digging was the toughest uh, job. There's nothing quite like digging out tree roots and stumps, by the way, if you want arthritis later in life in your hands. <laughs> <Just Wow. leave. laughs> hey, uh, you must be pretty good at tennis then if you taught tennis. And considering what you did uh, as a professional tennis rep, well, I look. I played in high school. I, I played. Uh, I was on a Division One college tennis team, so uh, I didn't ultimately. I played some matches, but uh, part of the problem is I had a bum foot, and so uh, I used to run cross country and play tennis uh, growing up. And I wrestled. Uh, I won't even tell you what weight I wrestled. Because <laughs> all your viewers would be laughing. I, I guess I will. I wrestled 108 pounds. That unbelievable. Was that ninth grade? It was. It was ninth grade and tenth grade. Uh, I think I was up at 108, 115 in that range, and mm-hmm. I was very, very thin. And I used to run about 60, 70 miles a week, and then bike a lot. So, and then work a lot as well. I was a, uh, a cashier and a stock boy at uh, a local store. So I used to be the guy that have to clean the back stock room, and I won't even tell your listeners what was in the back of the stock. Room. <laughs> By the way, whenever you say you were 108 pounds, you never have to follow that with "I was pretty thin." <laughs> yeah, unbelievable, right? Right, so, that, that kind of goes without saying on that one. Uh, let's uh, let's talk turkey here, and, and first and foremost, uh, we just talked to Ryan Weld. Senator Weld declared yesterday that he would be a candidate for the attorney general job vacated as uh, you will be running uh, for governor. Uh, have you talked to Senator Weld about the position? Did he inquire with you before he declared? I have. In fact, uh, I was pleased Senator Weld came in. He talked to me, and I tried to give him the benefit of the experiences I've had as attorney general. And uh, I won't uh, break anyone else's news today, but other people have come in to talk to me as well and to just learn more about the position. And that's critical because you want to leave the office in a really good place. I know that when I came in, it took us six months to a year uh, to get up to speed because we didn't have an electronic filing system. And we were learning about cases a year into my tenure. It was fairly disastrous. So you want to make sure that people know exactly what's going on and there's a smooth handoff. So uh, whoever will serve as our next attorney general is going to get the benefit of a really strong transition on uh, thursday april the 6th your office released a statement of uh, disappointment at the supreme court's decision on thursday of the 6th that denied the state's application to vacate the lower court's injunction against the state's save women's sports act during appeal to the united states court of appeals for the fourth uh, for the fourth Circuit, can you tell me about that ruling and what it means going forward? Absolutely. Uh, so we, we were deeply disappointed uh, because this was a procedural setback, and it pushes us back to the Fourth Circuit. Uh, we do feel very strongly that we're ultimately going to prevail on the merits, and that's because of how this case has developed. For those listening who are trying to track it from home, know that this is a case where originally – Our Save Women's Sports Law was enjoined by a judge in Charleston, and thereafter, uh, we went in and we submitted 3,000 pages, over 500 docket entries to the court, just strong evidence based on the law, based upon biology, based upon so many factors that this law was legal under Title IX, it was permissible under the Constitution. And the district court, after seeing all that evidence, he basically changed his position. He wasn't a fan of the law, but he changed his position and said, this is permissible. It's constitutional. Unfortunately, then almost immediately thereafter, 
the plaintiffs went to the Fourth Circuit. And once again, without much of a record and no explanation, uh, the injunction was reinstated. And so we thought that that was legally incorrect. And we went up to the Supreme Court. We asked them to remove the injunction. Obviously, they decided not to do so. But we don't think it's a tell on the merits. Uh, We think we still have a very strong case on the merits. But now we have to go back and argue. We think this is a matter of common sense and fairness that biological males uh, should not be participating in sports with women. And uh, I'm going to keep pushing on this issue because it's it's right legally. And quite frankly, I think that most West Virginians uh, understand that this is a sensible policy. If it was not a ruling made on the merits, what do you suppose it was decided upon? I think that the court looked at it. They're very leery to grant some of the procedural motions to lift injunctions uh, that are in place from a a lower circuit. Uh, And then they want to consider things that are on the merits when they think everything is fully teed up. Now, we think it was right, and we believe that the court below had erred and there was no reasoning accompanying the decision and that we're, we're right to think we're likely to succeed on the merits. But, you know, the court, I think, wants to see the process go forward. And so we will go through that process and we respect the process in the court. And we think ultimately we're going to prevail, but it does change the timeline. And we're now back in the Fourth Circuit. We'll be uh, doing our arguments this year. And then I fully expect that <clears throat> this is an issue that could very well go up, back up to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, next year. Are we, if if the uh, courts permit states to make laws that, that remain in place uh, for various situations, including including these uh, types of bills, save women's sports bills. Will the country basically become an alignment of conservative states that have one set of laws and and liberal or moderate to liberal states that have another set of laws where things where things are permitted? You know, it's it's a great question you ask, and there may very well be some division. Uh, between the red states and the blue states. But, uh, Rob, that's exactly what was envisioned by the founders of our Constitution, because people frequently talk about separation of powers between the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch on the federal side, but they sometimes ignore the separation of powers between the federal government and state government. And states were meant to be these laboratories of democracy, and be able to innovate because the federal and state government have different types of powers. And the state government is obviously much closer to the people. And I think that there's a strong sense under the Constitution and the case law that the decisions made by local legislatures should get deference. And so I don't think this is surprising. uh, But I do think overall, you know, I hear about some people talk about separating uh, the United States. I don't support that. I I think that we all need to work together as one country, and we need to make sure that we're uh, working and messaging to all states, red and blue states. But states should certainly be able to innovate based upon the electoral positions of their citizens, and that's certainly what you're seeing. Matt Miller. Well, I guess we already see that, uh, do we not, in cases where, say, West Virginia and and your office has led in a fight against some law that has come forth, and you say, no, this is not something that is going to benefit West Virginia, and other states similar to West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, whatever, may join in with you in that battle, and likewise, you may join in with other states. So we kind of already see that in many areas, do we not? We do. We do. And I I actually think you've seen this for a long, long time, uh, because states always are going to act pursuant to their people's interest. And uh, I think that's perfectly appropriate. And there could be some different perspectives. I mean, the issues and the needs of New York uh, or California might be different than the needs of West Virginia or Kentucky. And so it's perfectly, perfectly appropriate. I think that's one of the beautiful aspects of the Constitution and our system of government, that there is uh, a goal of devolving power down to the lowest levels. In fact, I would argue that uh, one of the challenges we've seen as a country is that as you have more and more power, uh, 
shifted to the federal government, more and more regulation, more and more taxation, uh, more and more federal agencies and programs operating, that that starts to strip decision-making power freedoms from the people of our states. And that's not a good thing, because ultimately, you want the Berkeley County authorities, the Jefferson County authorities, uh, to uh, solve some of your local problems, as opposed to everything going to the state. But if the local guys don't do it, you know, people are comfortable, you go to the state. But then it should be more rare issues that go to the federal government. And that's how I think we maintain this beautiful document and approach that the founders came up with so long ago. As we spoke earlier with uh, Senator Ryan Weld, who has uh, announced his candidacy for the office that you were in, he talked about, you know, uh, getting involved in, in cases and kind of having to, to you know, choose which ones are you going to really be able to, to go after and, and get a win for West Virginia. Give us an idea of how you go about that. How many things kind of come into and through your office? How many laws that do you look at that, that you go, I really don't agree with, but you know what, we might be spinning our wheels fighting that let's focus over here where we can get a win well i think uh, ryan well is right to say that and one of your biggest decisions that you make uh in public office is prioritizing the work uh that you do because we have certain duties that we perform for state agency clients and of course we um, have a rigorous consumer protection uh, division and uh, we handle civil rights we handle so many different matters for the state we handle the criminal appellate work but when it comes to a lot of the front office work, where you have a discretion to say, I'm going to challenge this federal regulation or I'm going to focus on this issue, that really is, well, what can you do to help West Virginia people in as much as, you, as humanly possible? So I'll start with opioids. Opioids is an issue where certainly we have consumer protection claims. We've pursued them. We've been very, very uh, successful. Uh, and we've had a lot of success. We've made that a huge priority, uh, close to $1 billion so far in settlement money, number one per capita in the country. That's been a huge focus. I uh, think you probably also know about <clears throat> the work we've done to protect our energy jobs. That's, that's really important for West Virginia uh, because a lot of people around the state rely on them. It's important for uh, oil, natural gas, coal, uh, manufacturing and we've been very successful protecting many, many thousands of jobs. And so those are items that have a direct nexus uh, to West Virginia. So every time I analyze what we're going to do, I look at how are we going to put West Virginia first, what's best for the citizens of our state, and we push. And there are issues that we uh, push every single day, but you'll always find that they're most critical for the state of West Virginia they uh, go toward upholding the rule of law and advancing our freedoms and our values and stopping a lot of the nonsense that tries to come in at the border. Is that somewhat part of the decision-making, whether you may be a lead state going after a particular issue as opposed to maybe joining with another state that they're kind of taking the lead on? Yeah, that, that's certainly part of it. So I think when you're looking at the role of attorney general, once again, you have to say, uh, what type of resources do I have to do the work of the people? And you have so much of it that gets captured by the appellate work, the DHHR work, the tax work, um, all, representing all the agencies and boards. Uh, we have a Medicaid fraud control unit now, a disability fraud unit, a consumer division that is 35, 40 people. So you have a lot of fixed statutory duties and then you might have eight or ten people that are working who might have a little bit more discretionary time. They may handle a lot of the, uh, the tough work that goes up at the West Virginia Supreme Court and the federal courts. But you're exactly right. We get together with our colleagues, and you look at uh, naturally who might lead on particular issues. And you know, I've always been of the opinion if you have a colleague that's working on an issue, and let's say they have a lot of expertise well, I mean, that makes sense that they may be able to lead, and then you play a role, and you might help shape it. But uh, you can't lead on every single issue simply because of the volume of cases. It takes many manpower hours to drive a, a case. Uh, but, for instance, on a lot of energy issues, we tend to lead on that. Uh, we've led on Second Amendment issues. We've led on a lot of opioid and fentanyl issues. And to give it put a finer point on this, Think of the immigration fight. 
We know what's going on down at the border. There are a lot of brutal immigration issues. So you see Texas and you had Arizona in the past. They spent a lot of time on actual border issues, um, suing INS and suing Homeland Security over the broad policy of these undocumented aliens coming in, whereas you see our office zero in on the fentanyl that floods in because of the huge holes at the border. So you just start to see the distinction. Fentanyl is slaughtering our citizens. We zero on that. We help Texas and other states on their issues. They turn around. They help us on ours. But you try to have a collaborative approach about when you're going to get out in front and lead and when you're going to be very supportive. Patrick, um, now that you've declared in the race, can you just, the, the big question, the big question you're going to get asked 10,000 times a week is, why you? Why are you the right person for the job to be the next governor of the great state of West Virginia? Yeah, look, I think it's a great question. And what I've always said is that I'm the only one in the race who has a conservative record of results of taking on the big fight and challenges facing West Virginia, and winning time after time after time. I mentioned the opioid issues. I mean, we have a depth of experience, and we've been wildly successful in this area, and now we're setting up a structure that's going to have the first funded plan for the state of West Virginia with the strategies how we're going to fight it. We're going to take that and walk that over for a lot of the fentanyl-related issues, which has become a, a huge problem. If you take on the of the job situation in West Virginia. I've now been fighting and protecting West Virginia jobs for many, many years, and we have not only the experience to help drive uh, West Virginia forward with our energy resources, but we know what the threats to our job base are. We're going to be able to take those issues on, and we're going to win as governor, and we're going to bring the full weight and authority of the governor's office to bear on some of the same challenges that we've had. Look at the schooling issues, educational attainment. We spent a long time, close to a year, working on defending the school choice law. So you get to know the innards of these issues. What's our public education system all about? What's our school choice system all about? And how we can expand that, have money follow the child. No one else has the remote level of experience to be able to do that on day one and no one else has proven in the conservative ranks who's taken on all these issues. They just have to fight against the elites and the political establishment in the swamp and win. And I think you're going to see good ideas coming uh, from this campaign, not just from me, but probably from other candidates as well. And we're certainly going to want to take advantage of that uh, after I get elected. But I think that there's a clear difference of the record of accomplishment and who people know is going to be able to take on those fights and win when he gets into the governor's office. And that's, I think, a critical part of the difference. And people are going to really see that in full force going forward. I like how you talk about the fact that there'll be a lot of ideas from you and other candidates and that if, if you basically, if you become the governor, that you're going to use those ideas. You're going to try to take ideas and take anything you can, you can see that will help, help build uh, West Virginia. Is there an issue that we have not talked about that you believe needs to be addressed by the, the, head, the head of West Virginia, the governor? What, what, yeah. is, what is the thing that has not been done? So one, one thing that we need to do a lot more of is that, uh, first of all, I want to say that we've been moving, we're starting to move in the right direction. There have been some uh, impressive gains. You, see, you start to see some job starts. You see lower taxes. You see school choice. You see the funded opioid plan. So let's give credit where credit is due when there's progress. But there's a lot more work to do. There are more challenges in front of us. In a couple areas, it's about starting to drive more people toward existing jobs that are available in the state. So let's take the issue of workforce participation. 65,000 open jobs here in West Virginia. Just want everyone listening to think of what would happen if we're able to fill 10,000 of those jobs, 20,000 of those jobs relatively quickly. Our economy would go on fire, and then we're going to be able to have more resources to invest more in terms of lower taxes, in terms of some of the infrastructure needs that we face. Those are the kinds of things that I think about. How do you drive the workforce numbers up? We've had a decline in population. We need to reverse that. 
and we need to look at the ways. How do you lure the next 100,000 people in? How do you keep people here who are fleeing? That's been part of the problem that we've seen over decades, that people have left our state because they haven't seen the job opportunities present. I think when uh, people know Patrick Morrissey is the governor, they're going to know there's going to be a supercharging of the economy and of workforce participation. And you're going to have someone also who is going to focus so much on making this a model for education nationally. And when you look at all of those issues, I think you see uh, if West Virginia focuses on those issues, that's how you're going to start to really uh, move the needle tremendously. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey has been our guest here on the program. You mentioned about uh, the fentanyl overdoses in this country resulting in death, Patrick, and relating that to border security. The latest number I could see from 2021 that was published showed that 70,601 overdose, overdose deaths reported in the United States were involving uh, primarily fentanyl. And if you, you back the math out of that, that effectively <clears throat> works out to uh, uh, eight people a day um, um, or an hour, I should I should say. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's awful at yeah, every level. Eight people and, per hour. You know, guys, one of the things that I'm going to do as your state's next governor is we are going to take some of the issues we focused on as AG to the next level. So, for instance, I've called for listing fentanyl as a weapon of mass destruction, and the numbers you cite bear that out. It's slaughtering our citizens. It needs more focus and energy from the feds. There needs to be more prosecution. Look, you have able and willing U.S. attorneys in West Virginia who would go after fentanyl. They're just not being adequately resourced by the feds and by Merrick Garland. We focused on the uh, issues related to China where the raw ingredients are uh, started. They flood to the Mexican drug cartels and they cross over the border. There's so much you can do. And interestingly, you can do so through a lot of these state alliances to shine a spotlight. When you have 15, 20 states working together on issues, it gets more attention. I think you're going to see a lot more of that into the future when I'm serving as governor. Patrick, thank you very much for your time this morning. As always, very much appreciate it. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, candidate for governor in West Virginia.